This episode of Legal Eagle was made possible by Skillshare. Learn to think like a lawyer for free for two months by clicking the link in the description. Michael Cohen testified in front of Congress for over seven hours. I have some thoughts. Hey Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer. Today we are covering the testimony of Michael Cohen, President Trump's former personal lawyer and longtime legal and extra legal fixer. Because Cohen testified for so long, I can't cover absolutely everything that happened in the hearing. This is going to be a compilation of the different things that I think are particularly interesting. So I wanna point out some of the legal principles that I think are incredibly important during this hearing, but I also wanna point out some of the rhetorical devices that Cohen himself and Congress people on either side of the aisle are using to make their points and ask effective and sometimes not effective questions of Cohen. Now, it's important to recognize that there are several purposes to this hearing, and it also depends on what particular side you're playing for. The first is to confirm or dispute the actual testimony of Michael Cohen. So much of what he said in the hearing was already out in the news, but there's a big difference between speculation about what he may testify to and actual evidence in the form of his testimony on the record under oath. The second is to get additional information that you had no idea existed before, the inside story that only Michael Cohen is privy to. And so for the Democrats' perspective, I'm sure that they want to get both evidence of illegal conduct, but also things that are just embarrassing and potentially don't necessarily rise to the level of illegality, but are just bad for the Republicans and the president himself. On the other hand, the Republicans want new information to discredit Michael Cohen and to show the world why no one should believe him. And the third purpose is to get your message out. Regardless of the testimony that Cohen gave, you knew that a lot of the politicians were going to grandstand because the world was watching and it was a forum to get their message out, whether you wanted to discredit the investigation or whether you wanted to bolster it. Now, as always, I want the comments to have a vigorous but civil discussion. Remember that Stella is watching all of your comments and she wields the ban hammer of truth. So make sure all of your comments are Stella appropriate. And smash that like button. All right, so let's dig into the testimony of Michael Cohen in front of Congress. Some will certainly ask if Mr. Cohen was lying then, why should we believe him now? Good question. This is a legitimate question. I had made it abundantly clear to Mr. Cohen that if he comes here today and he does not tell him the truth, tell us the truth, I will be the first one to refer that un those untruthful statements to DOJ. So one of the things that Congressman Cummings is doing here is what we call front running, which is when you know you have a bad fact or there is bad evidence out there, the worst thing that you can possibly do is hide it and pretend it doesn't exist. So he's getting out in front of that bad fact and laying the groundwork for why we should believe Cohen now and trying to take the sting out of the Republican attack. This is a classic and very important trial tactic that he's using here. Mr. Trump did not directly tell me to lie to Congress. That's not how he operates. In conversations we had during the campaign, at the same time, I was actively negotiating in Russia for him. He would look me in the eye and tell me there's no Russian business and then go on to lie to the American people. It's really interesting to me that Cohen says specifically that Trump did not explicitly direct him to lie to Congress. You would think that if he really was engaging in scorched earth tactics, he might as well just say that Trump directed him to do it. That probably would get him a better deal with the investigators and prosecutors. But credibility is incredibly important. And for him to go out, but not all the way he possibly could, that helps bolster his credibility and help silence critics that he's just simply uh, arguing over sour grapes about not getting a job at the White House. Because Mr. Trump had made clear to me through his personal statements to me that we both knew to be false and through his lies to the country that he wanted me to lie. And he made it clear to me because his personal attorneys reviewed my statement before I gave it to Congress. This is huge. I mean, this alone is quite a bombshell that President Trump's personal attorneys reviewed Cohen's statement, which is verifiably false to Congress and is one of the reasons that Cohen is going to jail. Number one, I would suggest that those attorneys lawyer up. 
uh, if they haven't done so already, because it's entirely possible that if they knew that the changes that they made to Michael Cohen's testimony were false, they can be liable and guilty of suborning perjury. And the prosecutors were able to show that the president was aware of and directed his attorneys to make those changes that can make the president guilty of suborning perjury. There are some uh, pretty heavy intent requirements there. It was recently reported that Michael Cohen has given Congress copies of the changes that President Trump's attorneys made to his statement that gave rise to him pleading guilty to lying to Congress. Those statements could be incredibly damning. I would not expect any of those statements to be protected by attorney-client privilege because I think the uh, joint defense agreement has been breached. And I don't think the attorney-client or work product protection would apply because of the crime fraud exception. So if I was the president's attorney, I would be very worried about what those documents show to Congress. I wound up touting the Trump narrative for over a decade. That was my job. Always stay on message. Always defend. It monopolized my life. At first, I worked mostly on real estate developments and other business transactions. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Trump brought me into his personal life and private dealings. A lot of people have asked me how it is that Michael Cohen can testify to communications he had with Mr. Trump before he became president, since Michael Cohen is an attorney and communications with attorneys are supposed to be protected. Well, it's a great question, but it's one that's very easily answered. Attorney-client protections only protect communications that are made between attorneys and their clients when attorneys are acting as an attorney. If you have an attorney friend who is working as an employee or a business person, just because they're an attorney, that doesn't necessarily mean that attorney-client privilege will attach. And Michael Cohen, for most of his career, it appears that he was rarely acting as an attorney and was really just acting mostly as a extra legal thug and potentially as a business person, a business associate. So all of those communications that Mr. Cohen had with Mr. Trump when Mr. Cohen was not acting in his capacity as an actual lawyer are not protected by attorney-client privilege. When he was president of the United States, pursuant to the cover-up, which was the basis of my guilty plea to reimburse me the word used by Mr. Trump's TV lawyer for the illegal hush money I paid on his behalf. This $35,000 check was one of 11 check installments that was paid throughout the year while he was president. Other checks to reimburse me for the hush money payments were signed by Donald Trump Jr. and Alan Weisselberg. So this is fairly damning evidence from Michael Cohen that the president of the United States, his son, Donald Trump Jr., and the CFO of the Trump Organization all engaged in a criminal conspiracy to engage in election and financial fraud by hiding these payments in order to prevent that information from becoming public and potentially affecting the outcome of the election. We have, of course, known about this for quite some time now, but Michael Cohen is going to jail for his part in this criminal conspiracy. And it's hard to imagine how that doesn't apply to Donald Trump Jr., the president, or Alan Weisselberg as well. Cohen states that this conspiracy existed before the election, was designed to affect the election, and it continued into the presidency when Donald Trump signed a personal check while he was president. There's just no way to sugarcoat this. It's hard to see how more people aren't going to go to jail over this particular act, if not others, since Michael Cohen is already going to jail for it. I have provided the committee with copies of tweets that Mr. Trump posted attacking me and my family and only someone burying his head in the sand would not recognize them for what they are. It's encouragement to someone to do harm to me and my family. Yeah, so the presidential tweets that surrounded this testimony, including some tweets from congressmen like Congressman Matt Gates, were so borderline witness intimidation that you have to wonder what they were thinking when they made those statements. 
Here, Cohen isn't establishing that they constitute witness tampering. That requires showing that the person who uh, put those uh, statements forward intended and had a corrupt motive to uh, prevent the witness from testifying. But Cohen is at least testifying that he took those communications to be a form of witness intimidation and was in fact intimidated by them. So it is at least laying a groundwork for further investigations to probe what in the world the point of those, uh, those tweets were. How long did you work in the White House? I never worked in the White House. And that's the point, isn't it, Mr. Cohen? No, sir. Yes, it is. No, it's not, sir. You wanted to work in the White House. No, you sir. You didn't get brought to the dance. Sir. And now? I was extremely proud to be personal attorney to the President of the United States of America. I did not want to go to the White House. So this is a good example of not asking questions that you don't know the answer to. Congressman Jim Jordan here wants to make the point that all of this is sour grapes. Michael Cohen wanted a job at the White House. He didn't get one. And as a result, he is now turning against the president. I don't know if that's true or not, but what I can tell you is that he opened up the door for Michael Cohen to opine and give his own story about what happened. He wanted to make a speech, but he gave Cohen the opportunity to directly contradict all of the points that he was trying to make. And on top of that, Congressman Jordan is acting in a fairly aggressive way, which is a tactic that can sometimes work, but it rarely does, especially where the witness is not acting hostile in, in any way. How many times did the president, Michael, uh, ask you or direct you to try to reach settlements with women in 2015 and 2016? Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry ma'am. I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I'd have to go back and try to recollect. It's certainly the two that we know about. And uh, why, why do you think the president did not provide the accurate information in his 2017 uh, financial disclosure form. So that was a good example of an open-ended question from Congresswoman Maloney, getting at how many mistresses uh, Mr. Trump had before he was elected and how many times uh, he uh, paid them off. She didn't get the answer that she wanted to, but unfortunately she didn't really follow up either. When a witness testifies that he or she is not particularly sure about something, you should always go back and you should try and get the specifics. Cohen testifies that there are at least the two. The simple follow-up question is, are there other women that you are aware of? Are there other women that he did not pay off? Uh, are there other instances that might have led to blackmail? Are there other instances of inappropriate payments uh, to women or uh, other people that might uh, have relevant testimony? So often in this hearing, the Democratic Congress people were not listening to the answers that Cohen was giving. He clearly wanted to get a story out. Whether you believe that story is a different question. But he was giving them information that they wanted, and he probably would have given them much, much more information if they had just followed up. You made some very um, demeaning comments about the, the president that Ms. Patton doesn't agree with. In fact, it has to do with your claim of racism. She says that as a daughter of a man born in Birmingham, Alabama, that there is no way that she would work for, a, for a, an individual who was racist. How do you reconcile the two of those, Mr. As neither should I as the son of a Holocaust survivor. There's a lot going wrong with what Congressman Meadows was trying to do here. When you have a demonstrative, which effectively he was making uh, Miss Patton out to be a demonstrative exhibit here, you always have to be worried about what people are going to do to that because you're opening yourself up to uh, further criticism based on the thing that you are putting out there. You can't defeat an accusation of racism by holding out one single black woman who you have employed as if that defeats that accusation. It, it just simply doesn't. It's bordering on tokenism in and of itself. And number two, you don't know how Cohen is going to react to this particular gambit. This is a lawyer's worst nightmare. Congressman Meadows really should have thought out the repercussions of bringing out Miss Patton in this particular venue. Just to make a note, Mr. Chairman, that just because someone has a person of color, a black person working for them does not mean they are racist. And it is insensitive that someone would even say racist, say, say it is racist in itself, and to use a black woman as a prop to, to prove it otherwise. And I can submit this for the record. 
if a colleague is thinking that that's what I'm saying, I'm just saying that's what I believe to have happened. And if as a person of color in this committee, that's how I felt at that moment and I wanted to express that. But I am not calling the gentleman, um, Mr. Meadows, a racist for doing so. I'm saying that in itself, it is a racist act. Well, I hope not, Mr. Chairman, because I need to be clear on this well, particular, Mr. Chairman. So this is a great example of the Streisand effect and why you don't make a big stink about something that you don't want to emphasize. Here, Congressman Meadows is upset about the implication from Congresswoman Tlaib that he engaged in racial tokenism by trotting out Lynn Patton to uh, refute the allegation of racism by Donald Trump. Instead of letting sleeping dogs lie, he makes a big deal about it, which allows Congresswoman Tlaib to read her exact same statement again and really emphasize the point that it was a stupid gambit to make in the first place. So if you don't want to emphasize something, don't make a huge deal about it. That is the Streisand effect in operation. To your knowledge, did the president or his company ever inflate assets or revenues? Yes. And uh, was that done with the president's knowledge or direction? Everything was done with the knowledge and at the direction of Mr. Trump. Now, a lot of this hearing focused on asset and revenue inflation by the Trump Organization for the purposes of loans and, and other financial dealings. When you're trying to get a loan from the bank, it's the bank's job to accurately value the property that's being put forth. So it's not surprising that people try and use very optimistic valuations of their own property in order to get a loan. However, revenue inflation is something that the bank might not be able to double check. The company is the one that contains the revenue numbers. So while asset inflation is not a good thing, it, it rarely gives rise to financial fraud. Revenue inflation, on the other hand, is financial fraud and could carry with it lots of different kinds of liability. So I wish that the Congress people had differentiated between the two because they focused mainly on asset inflation as opposed to revenue inflation. So you don't commit to uh, changing your ways, basically, because you want to continue to use your background as a liar, a cheater, a convicted liar to make money. That's what you want to do. And that's going to get me a book deal and a movie deal and television and, and, a, and a spot on television? I, I don't think so. The Republicans focused a lot on a potential book or movie deal from Cohen. That's an interesting uh, tactic for going after his bias. The more information Cohen gives in this setting, the less valuable a book or movie deal would be later on. On the other hand, the more famous he can become and the more central of a player he is in this whole uh, scenario, potentially that makes a book or movie deal more lucrative. So it cuts both ways, but I'm not sure that that means we should not believe Cohen here. So I'm not sure it uh, achieves the purpose that they're trying to establish here. The idea that a witness would come to us who's flawed, and you certainly are flawed, means they can never tell the truth, and there is no validity whatsoever to a single word they say, would discredit every single cr uh, criminal trial of organized crime in the history of the United States, because all of them depend on someone who's turned. So this hearing raises a really interesting issue that comes up in trial all the time, which is what do you do when you put a known liar up on the stand? Well, if you're the proponent of the witness, then you have to explain the witness's motivation for why they were lying before and why they can be trusted now. And then the most important thing you can do is bolster their current testimony with documents, have independent ways of verifying what they are testifying now is the truth. Now, if you are the other side and you're trying to dispute the evidence of someone who has lied before, you obviously harp on the fact that they did in fact lie and you should not trust them now, but you also have to establish reasons for why they would continue to lie at the present date. So for example, if you were dealing with a confidential informant in a criminal trial, you would wanna harp on the fact that whatever carrot the prosecution is offering to this witness is a reason for them to make up new information. If the confidential informant didn't have new information to give the prosecution, their testimony would be worthless, so they have an incentive to continue to lie. So of course the Republicans here are harping on the fact that Cohen lied before and cannot be trusted now. They have a difficult job here because the lies that Michael Cohen told were for the benefit of the president, especially with respect to the length and duration of the Trump Tower Moscow negotiations. 
So every time the Republicans raise the issue of Cohen's prior bad deeds, whether it's lying or whether it is threatening people with lawsuits uh, or whether it is illegally paying funds to pay off uh, porn star mistresses, it raises the specter of who benefited from all of those acts. And in almost every single instance, the benefit of those lies and illegal conduct is the president of the United States, the person the Republicans presumably want to protect. So I don't know if there is another theme that the Republicans could have gone with during this hearing, but the theme that they went with, which is that Michael Cohen is a brute and a liar, is true and certainly damning, but it's also damning to the person they're trying to protect, the president in this particular case. Is there any other wrongdoing or illegal act that you are aware of regarding Donald Trump that we haven't yet discussed today? Yes, and again, those are part of the investigation that's currently being looked at by the Southern District of New York. Man, so that testimony is a bombshell in and of itself. Cohen has testified that he is aware of other criminal acts that surround uh, President Trump. Uh, what I really wish the congressman would have done is follow up. He could ask, how many criminal acts is Cohen aware of? Uh, whether there are other people that have not been indicted yet who are responsible for those criminal acts. And perhaps Cohen would respond with the same answer that says, I can't talk about that because there's an ongoing investigation with the Southern District of New York. But that's a good answer for the Democrats. And isn't it also true that Convicted Russian mobster Sater even had business cards indicating that he was a senior advisor to Donald Trump, as reported by the Washington Post? Yes. Did convicted Russian mobster Sater pay rent for his office? No, he did not. So what I want to point out the congressman is doing here is he's repeating a theme. He's asking questions about Felix Sater. And every time he says the name Felix Sater, he says, convicted Russian mobster Felix Sater. It might sound ridiculous, but over time it sticks in your head. So every time you think of the name Felix Sater, you're going to think of, oh, he's a convicted Russian mobster. Of course, the person who does that the most is probably President Trump himself, where he will give nicknames to individuals to engender certain ideas and emotions about individuals by repeating that name that he has created for them. So that's what he's trying to do here. Let me ask you this, Mr. Cohen. Have you, done, have you uh, legally or illegally recorded other clients? I have recordings of people, yes. Legally or illegally? I believe that they're legal. Did you tell them? In New York State, you don't have to do that. So you didn't tell them? No, I did not. These are interesting questions as a, a practicing lawyer. Michael Cohen recorded his client's conversations with him. Uh, as Cohen actually correctly points out, New York is a one party consent state, which means the person who is recording is the one that consents to the recording and therefore you don't have to notify other people. It is unusual for a lawyer to record his clients, but it may not in and of itself be illegal. If I was a client, I certainly wouldn't want that and I don't think I would hire an attorney who, uh, who did record his clients, but as an ethical violation or as, an, as a legal matter, I'm not sure that it's illegal. I'd, I'd have to check, but my instinct is that in and of itself, it's probably not illegal. So in your testimony on page 13, you claim, and I quote, Mr. Trump directed me to use my own personal funds from a home equity line of credit to avoid any money being tracked back to him that could negatively impact his campaign. Do you have any proof of this direction? This is always a bad question. Do you have any proof? The question assumes that there could be one single piece of evidence that absolutely proves a particular point. When in reality, when you're trying to prove something, you use lots of tiny steps to ultimately get to your end result. And in response to a question of you don't have any proof, the witness could just go off for days about all of the different pieces of evidence that support the things that he's trying to say uh, while not absolutely in one particular step proving the ultimate idea. So number one, Cohen does have proof in the form of different kinds of evidence that support his case. And number two, you don't know how he's going to answer this question. He's not going to give up the ghost and admit, oh, I have no corroborating evidence whatsoever. So it's a bad question to ask and it's something that I find particularly annoying as an attorney. Okay, those are my thoughts about the Cohen hearing. This is more group therapy than it is a legal explainer. Michael Cohen is going to jail for a long time, but he could put that time to good use by learning a new skill, especially since he's been disbarred by the state of New York. 
For example, he'd really benefit from Simon Van Boy's Skillshare class on six steps to a successful writing habit. He could channel all the time he used to spend writing letters threatening colleges not to release President Trump's grades into creative writing. And copies of letters I wrote at Mr. Trump's direction that threatened his high school, colleges, and the college board not to release his grades or SAT scores. Or he could take Roxanne Gay's class on crafting personal essays with impact. It would really help him write that Rule 35 motion to reduce his prison sentence for good behavior. It is for the benefit of a Rule 35 motion, yes. Skillshare is an online learning community that has over 20,000 classes on everything like lifestyle, design, and technology. The first 500 Legal Eagles will get two free months of Skillshare when you click on the link below. The free premium membership gives you unlimited access to must-know topics so you can improve your skills and learn new things. It could even get you out of jail earlier, like Michael Cohen. So click on the link, get two free months, and start learning to think like a lawyer today. So do you agree? Leave your objections in the comments. Check out my other real law reviews over here. And until next time, I will see you in court.